Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. Hello and welcome back to Terrible Lizards and we are going to be talking, we've got a big subject for you today, which I think I kind of insisted on this because I find evolution and the concept of evolution quite difficult. That might be because I'm me, <laughs> but what I like about evolution, and I think I've got this right, is that everything on Earth is basically the same thing plus time. Not a million miles away, no. Yeah, that's a good start. Dave, do you, do you find the topic of evolution infiltrates um, paleontology quite a lot? Well, it does, because the, the one thing I like pointing out to, to my students, even when I'm teaching them about this stuff, is you know everyone thinks in terms of living animals for biology. Perhaps somewhat understandably um but if you want to look at evolution in particular over any kind of time frame you need the fossil record you know there are some amazing studies of things like you know the, there's the the grants there's, there's a husband and wife team that worked in the galapagos for like 50 years catching darwin's finches and putting rings on them and measuring beaks and toes and things like this on every single individual over generations i did this for like 50 years and that's the most extraordinary and amazing study in history and it's 50 years we usually think of evolution as operating over hundreds of thousands or millions of years. So however amazing that study is, if you really want to understand evolution, you kind of need the fossil record and actually living animals are not very, or living organisms are not actually great for that. So paleontology should be, I think, even more foundational to understanding evolutionary processes than it is already because biologists don't tend to think about fossils at all. I imagine the Grant's kids, their kitchen door is going to have the best graph and the best sort of like heights <laughs> You know, changing over time. I know that's not evolution, that's just <laughs> yeah. growth, but still. Because this, this, this is the thing, like, a lot of sceptics of evolution, or usually religious people who don't <laughs> like it, one of the things that they find frustrating about it is, is they can't, you can't witness it because it does take a large quantity of time. I mean, what sort of time are we talking about here? Well, so, so that's, that's obviously the first of an almost innumerable number of canards or misconceptions about these things is that it doesn't necessarily take a long time. On average, yes, it probably does to make big changes. But um, thanks to the fact that we have, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of scientists working around the world, there's all kinds of bits of evolution which have been literally directly observed. Um, the grants, actually, they had one only like a year or two ago um, where, oh, I'm going to misremember this story because it doesn't really matter because I wasn't paying attention that much at the time, but I think it was a male of one species gotting onto a new island and hybridising and then the offspring didn't quite fit with either the parent and started feeding on a new food stuff and it's like that's pretty much what you'd expect for this kind of thing to be going on you know we have things like oh there's a bacteria in i think it was found in japan that eats nylon well nylon is an artificial substance which was first created you know less than 100 years ago so the genes to eat and digest nylon must have evolved um i mean if you boil it down the, the standard definition of natural selection given now is simply a change in allele frequency over time and now you're going to ask what's an allele <laughs> exactly well this is the thing because you're a paleontologist so really all you know about is rocks i don't, well, I don't let's be honest i know nothing about rocks <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but that's that's the, that's the stereotype. So when we're talking about genes and alleles, what is the difference between a gene and an allele? What are we talking so, about? So so bear, bear bear in mind, very much not a geneticist. Though I have had to teach bits of this before, and I am trying to simplify. So I mean, geneticists will already argue about what genes are in the same way that biologists will argue about what species are. But generally, a gene is a bit of DNA which codes for a protein. Is I think a, a common definition, or or at least codes for a certain thing. But usually that means a you know the code required to produce a certain kind of protein. When I was at school, it was uh, the the different alleles were primarily only about eye colour. That's what we were taught. That was the example. So 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 a gene is something that codes for something. Let's stick to that horribly crude definition. And alleles are different versions of that gene. And yeah, a classic one that's given is eye colour. Even though that humans have multiple different alleles than multiple different no, genes. No, they have brown and blue. Make, uh, yeah. GCS biology. 
brown and blue eyes. But that's the idea: is that if you to give it, try and give it an example, is that yeah, we we all have two copies of everything. Though there's some weird organisms that don't, but usually have two copies of everything. And yes, for things like eye color, even though it doesn't in humans, but yeah, you could have a brown eye color gene or a blue, or, sorry, a brown eye color allele or a blue allele or green allele or grey allele, but they would all be versions of that single gene. So when we say an allele frequency change over time, that's what we're effectively meaning is therefore a population could shift between lots of blue and little brown to lots of brown and little blue. That would be evolution under that definition. In the grand scheme of things, that may not make no real change at all. You know, the average person looking at that population of animals might barely even notice that their eye colours were changing. But as you say, when you kind of went back to that idea of, you know, give everything enough time, that's what we're getting at. And it's that, yes, you know, that's just one allele, or that's just one gene and the allele frequency of that, but body size getting a little bit longer and beak size getting a little bit shorter and wingspan getting a little bit bigger and toe claw curvature changing a little bit more and eye colour changing and the tail getting a bit longer and all these other things going on, added up over enough time, can produce something that looks pretty different. That's what people are usually thinking of when they're thinking of evolution because they're thinking of bigger changes and new species in particular. Because we've touched on species before and we've Mm. touched on the fact that it's really a sort of like smeary line about what in between the species and when you can cut off a species. You know, if a species has been around two million years, could the ancestors two million years ago still still be the same animal really is the ones two million years later with all of the little mutations that have happened in between. We're trying to draw rings round a thing which hasn't got... We're basically trying to put a grid system on waves. Yeah, we're, 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 we're drawing... We're, we're cutting off a continuum and saying it, this, this is varied enough or different enough at this point, we're happy to draw the line when it comes to things like species. But evolution ultimately is a process. It is the fact that things change. So how do they change? So we've got the idea that presumably through reproduction, you're getting the same gene, but two, uh, one allele from one parent, one allele from the other parent, and due to dominance or whatever, one of those genes will appear in the um, in the next generation. I mean, actually, probably the easiest way to do it is, is to go back to Darwin, um, oddly enough. But he didn't know about genes, Dave. Yeah, but that, but that, <laughs> but that, but that doesn't matter, because what's important, actually, so the genetics obviously came later. We didn't know what genes was. Darwin didn't know what genetics was. We didn't understand the mechanism of inheritance when Darwin was working. But if you go back, you know, his, anyone who's read The Origin of Species, or its full authority, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favoured Races, I think it's the full title. Um, Classic. If you ever read the book, and I, I didn't read it until actually I think I started my first postdoc, it was very, very late. It's really tedious. Um, it's proper Victorian writing by someone who, good God, was going to make this point at incredible length whether you wanted to hear it or not and many times over but the big thing that Darwin talks about which I I think being no Darwin historian at all made a really big difference is he talked about artificial selection namely the breeding of things like horses pigs dogs cats and in particular for Darwin and a lot of people at the time pigeons because if you understand artificial selection natural selection kind of looks inevitable and we do understand artificial selection almost intuitively you don't need to be a farmer or a dog breed pugs yeah um right but but it, but that's the thing it comes it comes down to just two or three unbelievably simple rules and the first of which is there is a mechanism of inheritance offspring tend to look like their parents and we know that we look like our parents and they look like their parents and we look like our cousins because we're relatively close related and you know the family nose or the family ears or blonde hair or blue eyes or whatever it is tends to pass down through the generation i have inherited my father's beard it's lovely <laughs> So whatever the mechanism is, let's we know it's genes, but at the moment, let's not worry about it. Whatever the mechanism is, we know that you can inherit your parents and grandparents and so on's characteristics. There is inheritance. So that is true. And there is also variation because you don't look just like your parents and you're not a perfect mix of your mum and your dad, or even if you're a man looking more like your father or a woman looking more like your mother or whatever else, there is variation out there. We know that is also true. And then from a point of artificial selection, that is humans coming coming in and making a choice. So they bred two pigs together and there are lots of baby pigs and they go, that one's spotted than the others. And 
I like that one. I'm going to take that one out and I'm going to let that one breed with this other spotty one that I've got and see if I can make even more spotty one. And that I will mean, probably work because there is inheritance. So the spottiness is likely to be passed on. And there is variation, which is why some of them are spottier than others. And the and that's an artificial selection. That's all it is. And Darwin's genius almost in this point is kind of going, well, what if it's not humans making that choice for the faster ray horse or the prettier pigeon or the spottier pig? But what if the world does that? What if nature does that? And it's hot, so the ones better adapted to hot survive. Or it's dark, so the ones that are a darker colour are harder for predators to see. That's all it is. That's natural selection. It's that same thing. There is inheritance. There is variation. The conditions are going to mean that some of those things are going to survive better than others. Yeah, you say this, Dave, but I I prefer spermist theory, (laughs) which is a genius theory, sort of in the early... I think it's the late 17th century, which is the idea that each little sperm, which goes on to um, fertilise an egg, has got a tiny little little homunculus in it, it, and then that little person in it, if it's a male little person, will have its own sperm already perfectly inside it, and they will have little people in, and God has designed everything first... And really the only variation you're getting is the empty vessel or the female that you put it in. And then, it, and then that sort of like manipulates it to look a bit like her just because it's inside her for a bit. Right. That's, that's, that's another theory, which. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love historical theories on of science because that was that that was come up with the scientists. The church loved it, but that was a, that was an old scientific theory before evolution came about. And, but as I say, that that is that is ultimately all it all it boils down to uh, for na- for natural selection. We have actually talked about sexual selection in the past. Some people consider that a parallel system. Some people will that would say it's suborned by natural selection. But regardless, that that's what it is. And then, as you say, the question is then: Well, what is actually facilitating that? And as we now know DNA is the material which is our genetic code and which is that stuff which is being inherited and that can mutate in all kinds of interesting ways so that's the first way that you can get differences so what do we mean by mutation so we we literally mean some kind indeed almost any kind of error in the copying of your genome so as your cells divide and your body grows DNA in each cell copies itself and it will make mistakes that would be mitosis yeah it, it will it will make mistakes doing that so those are individual errors and they'll appear all in your cells all over the body all the time but of course they won't be inherited because they're bits of an arm or bits of an eye or or whatever but also when your body is producing sperm or eggs it does the same thing meiosis look at me go (laughs) but splits them in half and so sperm or eggs contain only half a copy and there's lots of things that can go wrong a single base pair what we call a point mutation so one of all the billions i think it is of you know acgt's the classic line that runs through these things that can just switch and be replaced by the wrong thing whole chunks of your genome can come out or come back in or be swapped around or turned upside down or taken out of one chromosome which is a big block of dna and bolted onto another chromosome chromosomes can fuse to each other chromosomes can pull apart from each other entire chromosomes can duplicate there's loads and loads and loads of things that can go on all of which are mutations and a lot of them certainly the big ones can have you know really quite nasty consequences and make you know, a, a cell or an embryo inviable or produce some very nasty and unfortunate genetic diseases. Lots of them make no difference whatsoever. Lots of your DNA doesn't do very much. It's what they call junk DNA, is that e- right? oh, Yes and no, because it gets it's a lot more complicated than that and I, that's where we start getting well outside of my knowledge. But certainly there are bits that don't do very much or that have repeats or are copied elsewhere. And the other thing is, of course, you, in a full set, you have two copies. And if one side is broken but the other side is fine that may not be a problem the working side will carry on and the broken side it might be have the dominant allele and the lower allele might be fine well no, that's a different that's a now you're, oh, con- that's now you're missing can we, two can we, different yeah no exactly so can we can we just go so uh, an allele is a is a, a a copy of a gene a version of a gene a version of a gene so your entire genome is your twin copies of everything your two strands we talk about strands of dna but they're all bolded up in chromosomes so it's not like it's one continuous bit but you've got two copies one from each parent and if you if you ran them down top to bottom they should be basically not quite quite identical because those are the differences but you should have the same bits for all the same genes okay some might actually be missing and if you looked at an individual gene they could both be the same they're the same allele or they could be different and they could be different 
alleles. And that can vary massively. You know, some some things are incredibly important to your development and they're basically the same in every human on Earth. And if they ever deviate from that, you basically would never develop. So genes are made up from bits of DNA, which is the A letter things, which is the double helix but stuff. Again, g- g- genes are a bit like species in that... So the, what we mean by genes, we mean by a bit of information. We means... usually mean a string of DNA that codes to okay. build something. Alleles are the different copies of that which we'll go into and which will yep. pass on the characteristics. Chromosomes... Chromosomes are big blocks. So Bigger blocks. So a gene is just a smaller block of a chromosome. Yeah. Okay. And everything is DNA. Yeah. So you, ultimately you've got a giant thing of DNA that is broken down into chromosomes and on that chromosome you could talk about genes. I'm sure sure there are subdivisions in between but i don't know them they're large and, and they're we don't relevant. need to get into subdivisions because my head will explode so keep it simple yes. and nicely and and then go. now you've brought up dominance so so if you have your two alleles again they could be the same they could be different and as we sort of hinted about with in terms of like repair or dealing with broken things your body could copy either and some things are considered by your body doing these odd things again we're skipping over such enormous complexity but it could do either of them or or it may favour one over the other. And this is really what we're getting to when we say dominance. In that if you have two different alleles for the same gene and one is dominant, your body will always copy the dominant one. So if you have, if you might have brown eyes, but that might be that the gene for brown eyes is dominant. Yeah. And you actually could have blue-eyed children because you could go with another brown-eyed person yeah. and pass on to less um, recessive genes, but, yeah. which so, give you blue eyes. But you've got a much smaller chance of that happening statistically. So that's 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 that when when you mentioned earlier about things skipping a generation, that's often what's kind of going on. Is yeah, if your parents both have brown eyes, they could be brown blue and brown blue, and you happen to have inherited one brown and one blue, and yeah, you all three of you would have brown eyes, but that blue gene is still floating around and you could then meet another brown eyed person who has brown and blue genes and yeah you'd expect if you had four children one to be brown brown two to be brown blue and one to be blue blue Blue, blue. and so one child would have blue eyes even though the parents and the grandparents all had brown eyes those blue eye genes were still floating around there you can have co-dominance so you could have a brown blue mix in this hypothetical example because again human eye colour is not determined off one alley of one gene um but you, you know you can get things you can get things like that and so yeah this is the this is an important part of that mechanism is that all kinds of odd little bits of genes are floating around not being used and can pop up again later in later generations in in other weird combinations of different things and all kinds of mutations can be going on you know everyone in the world or every population can have brown eyes and one of those alleles on one strand of dna mutate and it's now the blue but that's not going to show up because it's the sole blue gene out there but a few generations later when you've had some kids and they've had some kids and they've had some kids and now there's quite a few blue copies floating around suddenly two blue parents meet and have blue kids and now suddenly you've got blue eyed children for the first time ever but actually that blue gene might have appeared as a mutation generations ago and and the, the thing with that sort of thing is because people assume that natural selection there has to be an advantage at every single step of it this random mutation that's cropped up several times in a population that offers nothing because it doesn't even show in the characteristics of the animal you know that's something that's really hard to get your head around because it is random yeah and, and so so mutations are at their heart random that's not quite true again because certain things are more likely to mutate than others but as near as makes no difference in the grand scheme of things turtles are likely to mutate and uh, do martial arts yeah right. but but you but you you do get things like so we talk about a a C, G, and T. A always binds to T. Okay, okay. A double all right. bond. I know what A, C, G, and T are. Other people might not know what. We have got some, some very, very clever children listening to this. Well, I, but... well, I know, but we also don't want to go too far off. And I'm no geneticist. So you, again, it varies in different things. There's, there's you, uracil in a bunch of animals, and then you get even, you get other stuff in other animals as well. But DNA yeah. is made of four base pairs: um, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Um, and those are your A, C, G. And T. So yeah, A, A always binds to T and it has a little double bond, and C always binds to G and it has a triple bond. So actually, AT is more likely to mutate than CG because it's easier to break. Uh. 
So one thing that you see, see for example, is there are there are what's called extremophile bacteria, things that love extreme conditions, and these are bacteria that live in like temperatures of. But that's not for the but, bacteria. But you know, no. But you, you, <laughs> the, you know, there are bacteria living in water that's like 70, 80 degrees Celsius, or that's like five times as salty as the ocean, and they have almost all switched to having enormous amounts of C and G in their DNA because it makes it more stable and stops it breaking down in these unbelievably horrible conditions. So, again, mutation isn't actually quite random, but in the grand scheme of things, it effectively is. And yeah, it's. I, I think everyone thinks of mutation as being bad. And it often is. And big mutations, yeah, absolutely. You, you wouldn't even know about them because the embryos would never form or develop properly. But huge amounts of mutations are neutral. You know, yeah, that, that, that eye colour allele changes and it makes no difference to your eye colour because it's only one and it's recessive and the dominant one overtakes it. And even if it does suddenly do something and there's lots of blue eyes, maybe that makes no difference. It doesn't really matter to anything. And so it just happens to be there and, and sits around. Um, being ever so slightly taller or shorter or a longer nose or more teeth may make no real difference most of the time. But it could be the mutation that facilitates a second mutation, which now does make a difference. Or it doesn't make a difference until you have that one in a thousand year drought, which kills almost everything. And then suddenly having that beak that's just a little little bit longer than everyone else which means you can feed on some slightly longer flowers that no one else can is the difference between you surviving and everyone else dying and suddenly beat length and that tiny bit of extra beat length is the difference and millions of individuals die and a handful with slightly longer beaks survive and you know what the species now has a longer beak because only the long ones are alive and all the others are dead that's really like i'm now wondering what terrible thing happened to make giraffes you know maybe at the massive flood and it's the only only the giraffes with the longest necks, <laughs> necks. <laughs> could breathe yes. through the water. That's like a very extreme example. Um, it doesn't have to be a catastrophic event like that, does it? It could just be. I mean, we, you're you. Every single time we talk about anything dinosaur, it's always sexual selection with you. You're always like, this is why. Well, but but this is but right. But you, the, there is that point. So there's this there's this, this adaptationist argument, and this this is actually a big problem. I think paleontology. I, I say that it's not like oh my god, paleontology is full of adaptation it's a nightmare but it, it is a problem so the adaptationist idea is the idea that you know everything does something and I don't think that's true I think most biologists actually don't think that's true uh, you know exactly how long our little fingers are for example I don't think is adaptationist I don't think that's actually making some big deal to how we function as an organism okay modern humans are a bit weird but even you know going back I mean guitar players will get more they'd have preferred a longer one exactly. yeah but it's like but that that's the problem Problem is that it's very hard to know, even looking at a living species, exactly how important any given feature is. But it also means it's very easy to fall into the trap of seeing something and going, wow, this animal's got one giant tooth right at the front of its snout. It must be doing something special with that. Well, maybe it isn't. Maybe its genes are actually a bit weird. And what's really important is that it's got some big teeth at the side of its mouth. But the way the genes are tied together is that you can't have big teeth at the side of your mouth without having a big tooth at the front. This is a bit like your um, proposition that uh, T-Rex has got these tiny little arms, not because they serve any function being tiny little arms, but because it needs those little arms because the genes that associate the neck muscles holding its massive head up are also the ones which control for having some arms, and you may as well yeah. just have small ones because why lug them about if you're not using them? Well, that's the thing. It's it, that's the thing. It's not may as well. You you there is no functional choice unless the perfect mutation or perfect combination of mutations occurs to delete arms but keep shoulders. It might basically be impossible to get rid of arms. I don't know. That's a speculation by a friend of mine, but it's let's take that as being the case. But you know, if that is that really is the situation, yeah. The question of what are T Rexes are arms for shouldn't exist because the arms aren't for anything it just hasn't got rid of them um you know you could kiwis are a great example so the the kiwi bird the kiwis the the their genus name is apteryx it literally means wingless if you ever seen a kiwi skeleton they have arms so despite the fact that their name means wingless bird they they have arms but they, they have look, wings they look fluffy and cute no but their, their arms are so incredibly tiny they are reduced well beyond what you'd even think of with something like t-rex 
correct, but they haven't got rid of them. But that central, that central point being that, you know, again, you could ask the same question. Well, why does the Kiwi have arms? And the answer might be it hasn't got rid of them yet, or for some reason it can't get rid of them, but they're not functional. And this is that adaptationist trap, which is so easy to fall into for paleontology when you're dealing with really weird organisms and you don't actually really know what they're doing with them. It could just be that the answer is just because, which is horribly unsatisfying, but also quite potentially true. I mean, we have a, there's an issue when you're looking, studying like paleo um, humans. Do I mean paleo human? Paleo archaeology is what I mean. Ancient humans. And um, is that occasionally they'll find unusual specimens and you're not sure if this is a new species of human or if it is um, somebody with you know, who's been born with different um, characteristics just simply because of a mutation. Dwarfism being a, an example of something which can crop or giantism, which can, you know, crop up and gives you weird bones. I, I think a lot of them are a, are a bit of a misnomer. So that really came out with the, the so-called hobbits, so Homo floresiensis, um, about, what was it, 15, 20 years ago now. And there were these, these very small humans from the island of Flores in Sulawesi, so in the, in the uh, Indonesian island chain um, and there's several people going oh well this is just a rare form of dwarfism and it's like well it's not because actually as humans we have a very good understanding of dwarfism and Homo floresiensis does not match any known pattern of genetic dwarfism so if it is that's an incredibly specific case that you're coming up with it's genetic dwarfism but one we've never recorded before in the whole of medical history there are only and it several affected billion all people of these on organisms. the planet <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, it's, 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 it, but but that one is often used. And again, I've seen creationists talk about this. They go, oh, well, that's not an ancient hominid. It's just a dwarf or it's just someone with growth hormone problem. It's like, no, we know what that looks like. We we absolutely do. Um, there's a famous uh, condition called uh, ectodactyly, um, which can leave you with either two fingers or two toes and they, they're opposing. So it's like you have a little kind of claw hand or claw foot of a pair of fingers or toes that meet each other. And I've seen people discuss that go, well, maybe that's why T-Rex has got two fingers. And it's like, well, no, because we, we know what ectodactyly looks like. And it's a specific genetic change that has a whole bunch of effects on the skeleton. It's not just the weird fingers or toes. It does a whole bunch of other stuff. And none of them are present. And indeed, actually, the orientation and the arrangement of the fingers and toes is not like what you would see for ectodactyly. So it just isn't. Um, so yeah, humans are really useful in that regard because we have an extremely good understanding. As you say, any person you know, or any kind of unusual condition usually makes its way into the medical literature and gets studied. Um, so we have an extraordinarily good understanding of what happens with chromosome fusion, chromosome splitting, inversions, certain kinds of point mutations, and obviously lots of these produce some very unfortunate and nasty genetic conditions, but we do actually know what's going I on. I mean, chromosomal erosion, I mean, let's talk, can we just briefly say that, you know, men, they're just women with a, with a stunted X chromosome. That's what a Y chromosome is, isn't it? We are. So that's that's the famous, yeah, when you, all the chromosomes pair up and you have, for humans at least, indeed most mammals, you have what, what is called X and Y, and Y is a stunted little one, which does very, very little other than basically tell you to produce a bit more testosterone and some other stuff, which means that the embryo develops. But this is, but also it is a stumpy little thing. And one of the things it partially controls is um, your uh, colour vision, oh. which is why men, well, so, sorry, I've got that slightly wrong. I should say uh, colour vision is on the X chromosome but this is why colour blindness massively disproportionately affects men because the Y chromosome is shrunk away and has almost nothing on it oh. so when we talked about having those two copies of everything for us for, for us speaking as a man we have only one copy so if there's an error in that you don't have a good copy on the other chromosome to fix it and so men suffer colour blindness very very commonly because if you've got that gene you're stuck with it and for women, you'd have to have both copies ruined. So both chromosomes. And that's way rarer. I hate to sound woke, but I think we should say people with an XY chromosome and people with X. Well, yes. Obviously, yes, no. we're, not, we're not trying to be political. Let's put it that way. So I'm very happy to talk about that, at least very briefly, because I've got into arguments with people online about this. Yes, there are all kinds of interesting and unusual genetic conditions. There are people who are XY who are female. There are people who are XX who are male. 
Um, there are, and these aren't these aren't people who are assigned something at birth and then later decide. These are people who are, you know, we were assigned at birth their their sex. A very a very simple one, which I don't know how common it is, but you can. It's very easy to explain. As we talked about how simple and basic the Y chromosome is, and how all it basically does is turn on a couple of things to turn that developing embryo from male to female. What happens if the Y is broken? It doesn't work. So nothing kicks in to turn the to change those systems off. And so you will have a person who will be XY genetically, but would be indistinguishable as a female in any other way whatsoever, because the Y bit of the chromosome, the bit of the Y chromosome that goes B male, doesn't work. So it's just like they had two X's. Wow. Would they be fertile though without the two X's though? Um, well, some of the eggs would because they would have an X in and some of them probably wouldn't because they'd have a duff Y that doesn't work. Oh, that sucks. Uh, <laughs> but but, yeah. but I mean, my, my, my understanding there is there are there are people who have learnt about this only after a you know genetic test in their 80s when they've got kids and grandkids and everything else. And wow. it's like, oh, by the way, you've actually got a Y chromosome. It's just duff. You, know, you, you wouldn't, literally no one could possibly know this. And therefore, again, for, yes, we're, we're, we're not being woke. We're being literal biological here. It is perfectly possible to be an XY female and not in any way trans or have genetic abnormalities or anything like that. You would be as, I'm trying not to use the word normal, but I think everyone understands what I'm trying to say here, as indistinguishable as anyone, as an identical twin who was otherwise XX. That's really like, cool, be, isn't it? Yeah. And on the same on the same line, you know, you, you get some, I, I don't think it's ever turned up in humans. In fact, I don't think it's true in mammals. Um, but there's this amazing condition called bilateral gynandromorphism. Nice. So bi, two, lateral, sides, gyn, from gynecology, meaning women, and and from andrology, meaning men. So two different sides, male and female. <gasps> oh, I thought, yeah. It's it's fairly common in butterflies, uh, but there are even birds. If you, I mean, it's, <laughs> I was going to say, just, I'll just say, type Google gy- bilateral gynandromorphism. <laughs> That's a tricky one to Google. But you can find photos of butterflies where the wings are different on the two sides of the animal. And one side's got a little fluffy male antenna and the other doesn't. There is a cardinal, those beautiful red canary red birds with a little fluff of top on the top of the head. that you, These finches that you get in North America. There are bilateral gynandromorph cardinals. So bright scarlet red down one half of the animal with a little crest on the head and white and brown on the other for females. So I'm, all I'm hearing here is when you're drawing your T-Rex, what you can do is you can have the white with blue spots on one side and you can have the dark green tank colour on the other. Be- because obviously paleo artists are well aware of these kinds of features that are present in things like birds. There are absolutely images of bilateral gynandromorphic dinosaurs out there. People have already done it. Fantastic. And yes, I'm sure some of them existed at some point. But yes, j- just just to be purely biological, this idea that male and female and X and Y split perfectly is not not true. Now, I know that we have, as um, humans, I think we've got 28 chromosomes, am I right in thinking? Oh, God, it's 36. Uh, uh, is it 36? I, I, it might be 36. I it's think it's 36. Like, it's something like, it's one of those numbers which sounds important. It's something that I should absolutely know, and off the yeah, top of my head, I'm right. Like, you don't study humans, you study dead things. So, how does that, how is that different? Because I know that things like fruit flies have loads of chromosomes, for whatever reason, and then... Uh, I don't you know, think they have very many. Uh, okay. Salamanders have loads for no apparent reason and giant genomes their, their chromosomes are very big as they don't just have lots of them they're, they're lots of genetic does that make it more or less likely that they're going to get mutations and variations though oh uh, I, I don't know because it depends it depends what they're doing like you say yeah. it's junk junk isn't really the right word but there is we do talk about coding and non-coding there are bits that don't do things or bits that only do things in certain circumstances and that's where we're getting into even more complicated stuff we can start talking about stuff like epigenetics so so environmentally controlled oh, genetics. Oh, so when it gets hot, your genes wake up. Basically, so there was a thing doing the rounds just, literally just the other day before we recorded this about holly leaves. And if you look at holly leaves on a lot of trees, some of them have smooth leaves and some of them have spiky leaves. And basically, when leaves stop being eaten by animals, they make them spiky because although they're less efficient at photosynthesis, they don't tend to be eaten as much. But if nothing's eating them, they tend to make them smooth. I... And so that is the tree actively responding and changing itself and different genes are turning on and off as a result of this in response to being eaten or not um and that is an epigenetic process so, so if yeah, you the- want to feel christmas key go eat some holly because then it'll be spikier for next year <laughs> yes yeah. 
But again, this is something which I think when it was kind of really understood quite what was going on became a big thing. But we, in a degree, we sort of known about it. In You know, bonsai trees are an example of that. If you deny a tree lots of nutrients, it won't grow very big. It, it doesn't still try to jo- grow itself into a giant thing. You know, at some level, there is something going on controlling its development. And and there's lots of, you know, bonsai is a particularly ex- you know, extreme example, of course, but there are lots and lots of plants which will grow as a tree in one kind of soil and one kind of condition and grow as kind of a flat bush in another. I mean, um, I know it's it doesn't really count because it's artificial selection, but if you look at like cabbages and broccoli and sprouts and all of these different vegetables... And that, kohlrabi and cauliflower, they're all the same thing, and purple sprouting, yeah, they're exactly, all the same Exactly, and it's just the conditions that we grow them in and how we've selected for them. That Yeah, so we, we've selected for different bits of the plants on that in particular, but yes, it's, it's a similar kind of process. It doesn't take too much to dramatically change their output. Yeah, that's that's weird. So what do we know about dinosaur? I mean, we know lots, obviously, about um, extant dinosaurs. We know lots about birds and their <coughs> mutations and DNA and things like that. Do we know anything about... Because we've already said that DNA cannot survive a certain amount of time. Well, in, in theory, at least. Well, in, in theory, it could survive an extremely long time. It's just that it's so rare and it, the conditions would have to be absurdly perfect that it's effectively oh, so- never going to happen. Dave Hone just said Jurassic Park is real. That's that's what I heard. Yeah. Yeah. So, so so you know so for a, for a long time I think it was said that you know it was like about half a million years and beyond that you probably wouldn't get DNA. And we've now found stuff that's a million years old, and then we found stuff that's two million years old. But again, this isn't the whole genome. These are fragments and bits of genes. And again, the difference between two million and sixty-five million to get even the old, you know, even the last of the dinosaurs is absolutely extraordinary. You know it's going to be you know tens hundreds thousands of times less likely um and so yeah there are a couple of people who've said they found some protein fragments which isn't the same dna is a protein but it codes for lots of other proteins and some proteins like collagen that make up cartilage in your knees is very resistant to decay and other things like dna is a lot less resistant to decay but people tend to conflate protein and dna um and or think that protein means oh it's something very biological and fluffy and it's it decays really quickly so if you've got protein, wow, it must be, you know, incredible. It's like, well, not necessarily, you know, cut, which is pretty tough stuff to break down. So, yeah, there is that stuff out there. But personally, I don't hold up any hope that there's any real genetic material in dinosaurs. Yeah, but that's because you're British and a pessimist. So yeah, there's always or hope. Me. <laughs> but go, going back to that, you know, modern definition, you know, evolution is a change in allele frequency in time. Of course, we're not seeing that with dinosaurs because there are no alleles to look at. But we also know that the vast majority of their anatomy is going going to be coded ultimately by their genes. And so if you see, for example, tyrannosaurs, early tyrannosaurs have relatively long arms and relatively small heads with relatively large number of teeth in them. And as you move towards the tyrannosaurines and things like T-Rex and Tarbosaurus, they have less teeth in bigger heads with smaller arms and fewer fingers. That is going to be fundamentally genetically controlled, and that is going to have changed in response to natural selection. We can argue about the exact size and shape of the arms and yada yada what they're doing, but natural selection has clearly reduced those arms in size considerably. We can see a change over time in their anatomy which is going to be driven by some kind of selection process. That is evolution being observed pretty much at that point. And this is what then goes back to when we talked about, you know, the systematics of stuff and the taxonomy and working out what species are and how they're related to each other. Well, this is how we do those analyses. If we are happy that all of these specimens are T-Rex and all of these are Dasplitosaurus and all of these are Gorgosaurus and Albertosaurus and yada 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 and what that family tree looks like, we are then in a position to say, well, when did those things change? Which things changed in conjunction with which other thing? Did the legs lengthen before the foot specialised for running? Or did they happen at the same time? Or did the foot come first? And was that at the same time that their teeth changed? Or did the teeth change afterwards? And how quick was that? Because we can date our fossils, don't forget. So did the legs evolve really, really fast and then it took ages for the teeth to catch up? You can answer, well, you can ask those questions, but you can then answer them once you have a family tree of known species and an understanding that evolution is going on. Ah, but you, but I mean, you can immediately see the problems that you have, though, because you don't have all, 
that. You've only got tiny snapshots of data, really, and you don't know the environment that these animals were living in. So, yeah, I picked tyrannosaurs because they're something that I work on or something I'm interested in, but we actually understand and can answer those questions mostly pretty effectively. There's all kinds of groups, of course, where we can't, and actually we don't know very much about them, and that's probably not the group to go picking on right now. Um, you know, all those all those gaps at awkward times or whatever it is, but for most tyrannosaurs, we've got a pretty good record of them, their complete anatomy, when they appeared, what they were doing, and where they lived. So yeah, combining that functional study, how did they turn which bits of their feet and legs are important for speed and agility and things like that, is all there. Whereas, I'm just trying to think of a, a group, but I really wouldn't want to try and do that for... Um, oh, oh, I know, stegosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no one likes, no one likes stegosaurs. Um, but... <laughs> You know, um, you know, a group like the Coelophysites, you know, we've got a bunch of them, but they're all about in the same time and place. They're very early, aren't they? They're very early. You know, there's loads of very good Coelophysis in New Mexico. There's a couple of things which are referred to Coelophysis, but are usually called Syntarsus down in South Africa. Are they separate or not? Some people say they are, some people say they're not. Syntarsus has never been very well described. I think some of the material's missing. Ugh, you know, that's not the really kind of thing you want to do. And, and they're very close in time. That's tough to do any kind of big analysis on so yeah it, it absolutely varies but that's that's true of loads of other groups as well you know there's i think as something my a lot of people fail to appreciate is you know just how little we know about living species um i mean a point i made in my book which is coming out soon when's it coming out dave i don't know because the publishers haven't given me a date yet. well it'll come out soon and soon. you'll be on yeah. this podcast <laughs> yeah. talking about talking it. Oh, oh god yes <laughs> um you know but a point i made in that is you know we, we muttered about this you know the human medical literature you know okay there are a lot of humans out there compared to say you know everything elephant yeah elephants and giraffe and sea lions and, and anything else you care to make there are a lot of them but we have studied ourselves very 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 intensely you know there are I mean I'd say millions millions of millions of scientific research papers about humans and okay it gets into absurd minutia because that's the way biology is here is the effect of this drug on this population of men aged 35 to 45 who are from a white North Europe European background who are non-smokers but who tend to be vegetarian you know and only only unrealistic thing about that is you didn't make them student age but apart from that it's perfect <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and on and on, you know, and all the genetic problems that we've talked about, and genetic diversity, and you know, all kinds of obscure conditions. There are people who have their organs reversed, or their hearts on their right rather than on their left, and you know, there are people who are born smooth-brained and with extra fingers and extra vertebrae, and you can get tails. And, you know, very common minor things like a cleft palate, or you know, or there's people who have missing clavicles and can fold their shoulders together because they basically don't have anything. Yeah, they can clap their shoulders. It's weird. Yeah, but you know, all of that stuff and all all of the genetic process and all of the metabolic pathways and yada yada you know millions of scientific papers and do you know what we publish millions more every year because we're still finding more and more and more and we've been doing that for certainly intensely for a hundred years and certainly you know human anatomy dialed back hundreds of years Thousands. and we're still right we're still going at that rate you know there's things like the Sayola this beautiful weird little um, Vietnamese antelope that was only discovered in the mid to late 90s like I don't think there are any in captivity um there might be a handful in vietnam um i know of about three photos of them i'm sure there's more than that but whatever like we don't what's their gestation period no idea what's their mating rituals like no idea you know what how big are they on average well we've measured like three um how long do they live no idea what do they eat don't really know you know, plants obviously but you know what 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 animals eat don't know what and you know what fungi are they allergic to no idea you know and that list could go on for a thousand pages is and that's one species and there are millions of species and it's all species know. we haven't like we don't know about at all i mean well, I, well, I saw a statistic i think i read it in the new scientist that i think 95 percent of the world's ocean has not been explored or yeah probably i it's mean ridiculous the the, the, the the if you exclude bacteria because quite how we count bacterial species is complicated and contentious but even if you're just talking about you know like um uh you know, multicellular organs. Bats. Choose bats. There are thousands of different species of bats. Well, so so here's a wonderful example. So my uh, my good friend um, Beth Clare, who was a lecturer with me at Queen Mary and has just gone back to Canada. So Beth does some what's called genetic barcoding, um, among other things, which is a way of 
basically trying to ID species off a tiny bit of DNA very, very quickly. Okay. And that's very useful for things that are hard to tell apart. It's easy to tell giraffe from zebra. It's easy to tell most mice from each other. It's very hard to tell a lot of bats from each other. Mm. They all kind of look the same. And okay, I know I'm obviously grossly exaggerating, but there are lots and lots and lots of bat species that are extremely similar to each other, but we're fairly confident are different species. Beth has told me, and I don't think I'm giving away some giant secret here, she she thinks personally from her barcoding work that there are twice as many bat species as we currently recognize. Wow. Right. And we currently recognize like 1,500. There's about, there, there, there is generally thought to be about 6,000 mammals species of about 3,000 of which or so are rodents and another 1,500 of which are bats and another 1,500 of which is everything else. Only she thinks you should double the bats. <laughs> Right, so suddenly we go from 6,000 mammals to 7,500 mammals. Oh, (laughs) and then all that bat work we've been doing. Oh, was that one species or two or three or four? Yeah. And it's not like we do a lot of work on bats either. That's the, it's like, it's not like bats are some really well studied group with thousands of researchers working on them. There are. Well, my mate Sam came around my house with a bat detector and we definitely got pipistrils, but she also thought she heard like a falsetto, what they call the really high pipistrils. Yes. Yeah, which sopranos. they think is a, but a soprano, but that's we go. Soprano pipistril. And so she heard that for a second and she's like, mm, I'm not 100% sure. And then you've got that thing going, so do we have two species of bats or are they just one species with like, you know, so p- pipistrels are, are the are the absolute classic example of this is that if you cause I, so this was a large part done by a guy called Gareth Jones who was one of my lecturers when I was an undergraduate at Bristol and he was a big part of this work um, so yeah everyone knew pip- pipistrels are a very common small bat in Europe and if you're if you're in the UK and you see any kind of small bat flitting or you know something like mouse sized flitting around it's probably a pipistrel um, and everyone knew that there's basically two lots of pipistrels in that there's kind of browny ones and there's kind of grey ones but they're basically the same and actually if you measure their calls some call a bit higher than a bit lower and this is the classic thing that genetics changed because once genetics became you know we we knew what genes were in the 40s and 50s but like until you could actually do this very quickly and simply and cheaply you know taking an individual and looking at its genetic was incredibly hard to do so no one did it until like the 90s and even then that was a big expensive study and they started looking at pipistrels and went no hang on all the brown ones live in one place and all the grey ones live in another place and you never find brown and grey ones together and they call it different pitches and actually if we look at their genes they're not breeding with each other well if something looks different and sounds different and doesn't breed with the other thing it's a different species and so pipistrels like the absolute most bog standard european bat suddenly became two species and it's like something that common and that obvious and that well studied we'd missed then yeah when you get these horrible species complexes of neotropical bats buried in you know ecuador when no one's looking at them in any great detail or like you know there's two Two researchers have been working on this for 20 years, but like against the dozens and dozens of species. How many actually are there? Uh, and yeah, Beth, Beth has talked about this stuff to me and said like, you know, you, she, she, she does a lot of stuff in Central America, you know, Mexico down to kind of Guiana, Northern Brazil kind of area. And you'll speak to researchers and they go, uh, you know, it's like getting out your bat guide and it doesn't match any of the bats. And they go, no, no, see in Brazil, this species is just much bigger with ginger wings. And you're like, so it's much bigger and a different colour and lives in a different place oh it's like the opposite of dinosaurs because dinosaurs when you first discover them everybody finds bits of different species then you slowly realize they're all the same species and then bats are the opposite (laughs) right but it but at least part of it with the bats is probably because they're not functioning like us and this goes actually you know as in we are visual orientated animals and so are an awful lot of mammals despite their limited vision um you know they're as in limited color vision you know they have good eyesight they're good at recognizing patterns well bats don't do that they're nocturnal and they make little calls to each other and so they don't care what each other looks like they care what each other sound like and so that's how you can hand some very very similar looking bats because they're flying in similar places and feeding on similar things in similar ways but their calls are different and as far as they're concerned they're totally different they literally can't hear each other so they're never going to breed but we would just look at them and go well these two look the same and we can't be i think before we before we sign off and sort of you know one thing i really want to underline for because i have i have a lot of religious friends who think that there is a sort of grand design to stuff 
And the main reason that they sort of doubt evolution, I think, as a concept, and they can't get their heads around it, is the idea that things should be a certain way. Is there a way that you found to sort of get the idea across to people that th- th- that it is? Because I always think of it like throwing a deck of cards at the floor and going, well, that is the way it had to fall. You know, because, you know, it's the blind cl- it's the blind watchmaker. Everybody, well, how can you see this perfectly designed thing and think, oh, my goodness, it's, it, it, it's chance? Well, so that's the thing. It's not chance. So um, Mike Taylor, so a sauropod biologist, who himself is is quite religious, and he has used this argument, and it's quite good. He says it's it's random in that you're rolling dice, but it's not random in that you get to keep the sixes. Mm. And and that that's the thing because that they hear random and go, well, it's just random. So how could it possibly happen? No, because it's every generation there's a random number of changes, but the sixes survive. And if that's height or your giraffe neck length, then yeah, curiously enough, over a bunch of generations, the neck gets a lot longer. For every single time you roll the dice, you can keep a six and add it to your pile your pile of sixes is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger um so that's the first thing it's from that thing is like mutation is random not quite but mutation is random but selection isn't selection is literally non-random it's the long neck ones survived or the long legged ones or the ones with bigger eyes or flashier tails or whatever else it is uh, and the second thing again on that front is the idea that you know humans or any organisms are well designed they're not there are <laughs> horrible mishmash of compromises i, I mean the, the the most obvious thing is eyes so eyes are the thing that everyone picks on and you know this, this this has been the the intelligent design movement's big one is oh how could you design an eye and it's like if i was going to design an eye i would design it a damn sight better than the human one with the blind spot it's nice things could surprise you so that's thing. so first of all things like cuttlefish can see in um uv and infrared mantis shrimp can see more spectra of color than any other organism on earth if i was going to make a really good eye i'd probably start with that i've always wanted to get a mantis shrimp but put it next to a microwave so it can see the low dark colors going around <laughs> yeah it, 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 yeah they can so so that's the first thing is you know you could definitely yeah, give us better vision in terms of you know making it you know see into different spectra you could give us bigger eyes which would actually give you greater visual acuity that's quite a big deal um we'd look a bit weird to ourselves but you could absolutely put a bigger eye in our head and have better vision or put them slightly more to the side so you can see a bit further behind you yeah potentially um um, and then the other big thing, as you say, is the blind spot. So, you know, in order to see light is coming into your eye and it hitting light sensitive receptors at the back, that is basically being converted into a nerve impulse which is going into your brain and your brain is putting it back together. Now, you might think, therefore, that there is absolutely, other than the kind of, um, you know, gloopy bit that is in your eyeball to give your eyeball a spherical shape, but, you know, but the, the light is basically going, hitting your eye, going through the clear lens, going through the clear gloopy bit and hitting your sensitive cells oh no 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 because we've built our eyes backwards we've built inverted commas the nerves that are carrying that signal into your brain sit between the light and the sensitive cells worse than that we've got blood vessels going across the front of them as well so the light has to come in and not make its way through because of course light travels in a straight line but a lot of that light is blocked by blood vessels in your eyes or blocked by those nerves that are running along and as i say all the nerves as you said all the nerves cluster together at one point and go back through that layer and that is your blind spot there is a part of your eye that literally cannot see because it has none of those light sensitive cells it is just the nerve cluster to go into your brain and things like cuttlefish don't have that they have the blood vessels and the nerves at the back behind the light sensitive cells so yeah our eyes are terribly designed they're backwards in lots of different ways and they have none of the range of you you know basically all reptiles and birds can see in uv you know that's an awful lot of species well that's because they didn't have to go all nocturnal in order to survive and got rid of all of their color in order to be really good at seeing in the dark true at some point when we're small little things my favorite example about how the human body was badly designed is by dar o'brien who says have you ever bitten the inside of your mouth intelligent design that's (laughs) when you can actually eat your own face It's ag- I've done it several times, uh, and I, I, I'm, I, I tend to get mouth ulcers at the best of times. And yeah, when I've accidentally chewed the inside of my cheek, that is weeks if you do it really pain. hard. If you do it really oh, hard. Oh, you think you've bitten some? Ah. Mm. Well, wisdom teeth, you know, there's a, you know, you've got too many teeth in the jaw. I mean, yeah. 
<laughs> there's a reason they they take them out. They don't fit. But the thing um, is, you don't need to live that long. So you know, it's fine. Right. Um, you know, <laughs> and you know, and and so many things. Like, you know, there's a reason people have bad backs. Yes, modern society and work and the chairs we use and stuff is bad for us. But fundamentally, our our backs aren't built very well because we're supposed to be quadrupeds that have gone to being bipeds. We're very vulnerable to rolling our ankles, which very few long distance running animals are. They fuse everything up and ours are very, very loose because again, we've only been running for a couple of million years and that's again, that sounds like a big long time, but it's not really enough to have kicked in and fixed everything. It's about the shoe industry. It's just just the shoe industry (laughs) keeping us so so we can point our toes. So yeah, humans are not and indeed all animals are not well designed. They have all kinds of weird genetic legacies and things that they've inherited from their ancestors and they only have a certain toolkit that they can build from because unless the right exactly the right combination of mutations comes along at exactly the right time you're not going to be able to fix that problem and here we are i mean again talking about vision i, I believe there are tetrachromatic humans that are very rare but they have some odd gene combination that gives them a bit more color vision and they can be sensitive to some to some other other wavelengths but the that thing people is aren't. you'll never really know you know you just assume yes because color is one of those awful yeah, things yes it's just like yeah. Well, but we we can describe light wavelength scientifically and see which people can and can't see. Oh yeah, lengths. I mean, there's tests for color blindness. Even if we're going to argue about whether or not this is pink or fuchsia, yeah. um, we can we can definitely say this person can see. To... But it doesn't mean our brains all interpret it in exactly the same no, way. No, true. But again, but that, that that's that variety. So this is a one I found out about fairly recently. So there are also monochromatic humans. There are people who have no color vision at all. They only see in black and white. And do you know? what they have what? the most amazing night vision and long distance yeah I can imagine because they're, they're not trying to get you know that TV pixel problem of having three different dots and one point just to get the colour all three of those are now effectively binary black and white uh, in the second world war there was a massive push apparently in like in every nation to find these people <laughs> and just go do you want to be a bomber on a plane yes Nav- <laughs> navigators who can see in the dark beyond what other people can um, and similarly ship lookouts looking for things because that's the thing they don't just see well at night because they're very good at that but they also have incredible visual acuity I was talking to a friend of mine about this at lunch uh, several months ago you know, a, a fellow academic colleague and he said my friend has that he said when when we go out driving and you're on the motorway and you see a li- you know you see that little blue sign up ahead and you know when you get close to it it's going to say you know next junction for this and so many miles he says he can can read that sign when I see a blob to tell me there is a sign coming up. Wow. Yeah, but let's take that from the natural selection point of view. Let, 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 let's, let's go darker. Let's, there's an apocalypse and we lose all electricity and everything at night and Yellowstone we've got no Park. torches. So the Yellowstone volcano yeah. explodes. <laughs> yeah. Really dark na- in the daytime, definitely yeah. dark at night. Yeah, and, and, everyone's, and everyone's struggling for food and society. right. right. Who's going to do well in those circumstances? The people who can see miles at night everyone else has a big problem like that that's what we're talking about yes you are likely to get these small progressions that will change leg length and tooth length and tail length and feather color and whatever else it is but also big dramatic events can massively accelerate that and you can imagine that the people with really good eyesight or a really there are hype there are super tasters and super smellers <laughs> people have extraordinary taste and smell that's what they're called you again you find them in the wine industry you find them in the food industry i get i I get told off for my sense of smell. I was thinking for being a super smeller. Oh, ha, 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 ha. that too. Um, but <laughs> but again, you can imagine that all of those different groups are likely to do well in those circumstances, and they're still going to find and meet each other and have kids. And so, in a few generations, you're going to have kids who uniformly only see in black and white, but with an amazing sense of taste and smell. And when you think about it, Dave, it does matter the social aspect of humans. But because we can communicate and we can make friends, we only need one person who can see a long distance as long as there are mates. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
And that's that's the advantage of uh, language and speaky speaks. However, I think <laughs> we've um, spe- spoken speaky spoke quite a long time. We have we mentioned dinosaurs a bit. I, I would have told the story about how they're training little pigeons to tap on glass when they see tiny representations of lifeboats or bright orange lifeboats that humans can't perceive, and yeah. then they tap, and they've actually got a little uh, like uh, electronic sensor system to where the bird taps on the screen, and then they tap. When where it is and they get rewarded to seed but that means that you can put these birds on um, accident emergency things and they will point you to uh, where aircraft have gone down and where boats are sunk and there's a life raft anyway we, we can't talk about that because dinosaurs have amazing vision but what we can do is we can sort of say I hope that has helped clear that up for you guys do remember if you've got a question for us about particularly about evolution if you want to carry on this conversation um, please do email terriblelizardspod at gmail.com or get in touch with us via our Patreon um, which is patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards you can obviously become a patron and get all the, you know the extra stuff that we do there um, and support the show that would be very cool what are you having difficulty with understanding because I, I, I now know it all <laughs> particularly about bats I'm very good on bat evolution um, but yeah if, if there's stuff that we've missed out that you want us to cover please let us know because it is a massive subject and uh, yeah uh, I think you did quite well though didn't you Dave <laughs> I, I, I genuinely didn't think I did. So, <laughs> okay. Well, we, you know, we can, we can retouch this. We do a questions episode at the end of every series. But let us know what you thought. Um, other than that, um, we'll be back with you next week with some proper dinosaurs. And until then, rawr. Rawr. thank you for listening to the Terrible Lizards podcast. To support the show, share this episode and leave us a review, especially with dinosaur emojis on your app of choice. You can also become a patron on patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards where you will be rewarded with extra content. For more information about Dave and Izzy and our books, other podcasts and blogs, please visit terriblelizards.co.uk. We hope to keep making this content and it's down to your support that we do. So thank you.